Hello and welcome to what promises to be a very, very exciting conversation today. The gentlemen who will be joining us shortly aren't just very fine, very accomplished actors, they're also very successful producers with impeccable taste. They've been at the forefront of some big changes in the movie business. They're early adopters and champions of streaming services and currently they're navigating the new media. So let's take a quick glimpse at some of their recent work. Swar's been running eight years now, given your reputation and your formidable drive. Our hope is that you're the man who will get the job done. What is this new direction? We build Afghanistan into a free and prosperous nation. All the times they are Winners and losers. But in life, every loser gives a chance to give one chance. And this is only a trailer. The picture is now the rest. My friends. So without any further ado, join me in welcoming Hollywood's Brad Pitt and India's Shah Rukh Khan. Thank you. Right, Thank you. You know, I'm just going to say it because I'm pretty sure everyone in this room is saying it in their heads. This is a pretty incredible moment. Brad Pitt and Shah Rukh Khan, two of the biggest global superstars. Gentlemen, this is a very special moment. All right. Yeah. Good on you. <laughs> Brad, this is not your first time to India, is it? No, no. We actually shot a mighty heart here. So we were here for a few months and got to explore a lot of the country. It was a fantastic experience. Good you know, to be back there are, here now. There are locals in Pune who got used to seeing you on the bike and yeah. you waving out to them. Yeah, it was good. I got to scoot around on an old Royal Enfield and put a helmet on and just get out amongst the masses. It was really nice. You know, it's interesting. Both of you actually started your movie careers around the same time. Brad, Thelma and Luis, your big breakout hit released in 1991 and that led to this exciting um, long career. Shah Rukh Diwana, which was your first film, big runaway success, released in 1992. What's the secret to staying relevant, successful, and influential for 25 years? Who you want to take that one? No, you have no idea. I was no idea. looking at you. <laughs> I would say luck. I'd say a little bit of luck, but I also uh, uh, I'm trying to reinvent, you know, constantly uh, uh, trying to look for something new, something different, and uh, and I, you know, fortunately, I guess we were able to survive our mistakes along yeah. the way. And uh, I, I, I think uh, just staying relative. Yeah, mainly that, I think, you know, to be able to survive your mistakes. And mistakes were normally things which are very close to your heart, mm. you know. And, um, uh, and, and if they went wrong, somewhere down the line, the only thing that keeps you going is the fact that you're still surviving. Mm. And uh, you try and do it as often as you can, as much as possible, and I think, uh, he more than me would tell you that you know to be uh, such a successful star uh, around the world, there are a lot of lot more expectations from you, mm. and you need to keep it very simple. Then you don't need to be uh, trying to work for those expectations or keep on doing the stuff that people expect of you. Mm. You keep on doing what started you off, which is being relevant, being novel, trying to you know uh, kind of reinvent yourself, and the simple things which made you want to be an actor in the first place. You know, you both have enormous success, but also enormous pressure. How do you balance, or how do you really combine artistic integrity with commercial success? Because that's a huge pressure on both of you, I'd, I'd imagine. I say you just have to make sure you get time for yourself, time for your friends, time for your family, and let the next idea percolate. Uh, um, it's, not, it's not so difficult to achieve a balance. Um, I'm, I'm able to compartmentalize pretty well the private life and the public life. How about you? I, I do that too completely. I mean, I, um, as far as work is concerned, I think what he says is the, um, actually the, the crux of it. You know, if you can be leading your public life, which is on sets also, yeah. um, invariably, I think if you can protect it in terms of that from your private life and your private life from the public life, 
I think when you go back home and you're leading the regular stuff that you're supposed to do, uh, in, in whatever form, with family, friends, I think it just keeps you uh, uh, kind of grounded. You know, like, um, like my kids, I mean, more often than not, don't like my films. And that's, <laughs> that's nice. Really? Yeah. And that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they really, whoa, oh, this one was so boring, Papa. So, you know, it's like, it's not the biggest thing in the house, Papa's film to do well. It is not a special thing. Mm. It should not be a special thing with family and friends. And invariably, you know, we make friends even in the film industry. And then everybody kind of just starts uh, pushing you along and saying, no, this was the best thing you did. Yeah, it was different. I think the real friends in the film industry also tell you, or oh, keep it simple and keep it normal. I think that's what actually really helps you and takes the pressure off. That at home, you're a nobody. Right. And uh, as long as you're a nobody with your friends and at home, I think you can be a big star like Brad Pitt outside. You know, I would imagine that it's not just me. Um, everyone in this room, I would imagine, wants to know how do you pick the films that you do? How do you decide what you want to do next as an actor? Well, for me, it depends a lot about, you know, who's telling the story. Mm. You know, you, you, it usually starts with a script, a good piece of writing, and, uh, um, and the decision to go investigate that. And then you want, I want to surround myself with filmmakers I respect because we are ultimately putting ourselves in the director's hands mm. and, and uh, there then you have a real freedom to go explore, to, uh, to, uh, to go out as far as you can go and you know you're in really good hands. So, and at the end of the day after, I don't know about you, but after doing it so long, I want to I wanted do it with, with friends and people I like and, and that seems to be more important to people I surround myself with than, the, than anything else. I've said so often, it's exactly the same thing. I, I've even said it before that I sometimes don't even want to know the story. As long as the people who are telling the story are people I enjoy working with. Um, as a matter of fact, because now in India there's so many new filmmakers. Mm. Uh, I don't know them. Uh, I haven't gotten to know them personally. And, and it's not just doing it for a friend, but I try to spend a couple of years with them before I start the project. Sure. You know, just to be comfortable. I think, at, you know, after 20, 25 years of work, what matters to you most is the people who are making the film for you uh, and the people that you're trusting with whatever little bit of talent you have. And you say, okay, this is in your hands, now try and make me look the best you can and I will completely trust you. And you can only do it with people that you're you know, kind of easy with or friends, like you said. I've done that for the last 15 years. I've really never really worked out of what a lot of people call the comfort zone. But it's not the comfort zone. Or maybe you require that comfort to be able to tell a better story. Good to have talented friends, right? Mm. Yeah, that's yeah, that's important. Sure. <laughs> how long is a, a how long is a shoot on a Bollywood film? Um, it, if it's an action dancing film, about 120 days, 140 days. Yeah. Uh, sometimes longer if things go wrong. And uh, if it's a simpler film, then about 70 days. It's about the same with us, when we don't have dancing. Right. Yeah. I would never make it in Bollywood because I can't dance. <laughs> no. Uh, I, I can't. We, we, I can't. We'll, we'll make you dance in Bollywood. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We make everyone dance in Bollywood. I think, I think it'd be the first film and the last. <laughs> do your roles seep into your life? Um, do they change you? Do, you? do they stay with you or do you discard them? I guess, I guess they kind of feed each other, your, your, your individual life and what you're investigating in a film. It has to in some way. But I quickly discard them and, and move on to the next, so move on to the next project. I, I use a term which I describe a lot of uh, film work and I call it demotional. Uh -huh. I'm extremely emotional when I'm doing it and then I'm completely detached once it's over. I need to, I need to just move on to I can't stick on to something and I've been asked many times playing this character role has it changed your life? No, mm. it hasn't. You know because like he said it's, it's, it feeds off your experiences and then you try to put them into a character or a role and then you just move on. It's your experiences finally. Of course the quirks that you put in or any mannerism that needs to be put in or research into a biopic kind of space, all that, yes. Uh, those, I think, are you know, just uh, technicalities as an actor that you learn and work and prep for. But beyond that, no. I do one and uh, I take a two-hour long bath on the Friday the movie releases. Try it. It works. <laughs> two hours and then by Monday I'm through with it. I, I don't want to be uh, a part of it anymore. <laughs> Was there one character that was just hard to wrap your head around, one character more than others, um, that was difficult to get into? I don't ask, I'd, I'd ask him about Benjamin Button. 
Sure. I'd ask him about a film. I forget the full title. Twelve Monkeys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I found you amazing in that one. Yeah, thank you. It was, yeah. it was fantastic. <laughs> I don't know how many of you have seen that film. Yeah. He was mind blowing in that film. I mean, that's where I became a big fan of Brad as an actor. Burn After Reading. Of course. Uh, and there's some lots of them, hundreds of them. But I would, I would, I would ask you, uh, just uh, continue with that one. Did Benjamin Button or any of these films? Those were, those were all. They took a. Especially Twelve Monkeys took yeah, a Twelve lot of awesome. uh, uh, insanity, locking myself in a in a room for a couple of weeks, and uh, just seeing how crazy we could get. But uh, no, no, it's just part of the. Um, I wouldn't. I, I call them all challenging, but it's what we do. I wouldn't say any were difficult. Some, you know, um, landed better than others. Mm. But um, but I, it just seems part of the process, part of the craft. You know, I'm going to speak for, for most of the fans, and I'm going to ask you about Fight Club, Tyler Durden. No, that was just fun. That right. was just fun. <laughs> yeah. Anytime, you know, something's irreverent and, and, uh, and it's a great piece of writing and a, and a real, uh, a dear friend of mine, David Fincher directing, mm. um, and Edward Norton. No, we mainly just laughed. <laughs> Much like this one, actually. So, for you, a particular character that was hard to wrap your head around? You know, because we have singing and dancing in our films, mm -hmm. uh, more often... I can't than, sing either. You can't, I also don't. I'm yeah. Mini Vanelli. Uh, they, they sing it from the back. I just, uh, because they have singing and dancing, I, it does become... A, and and uh, as you know, the commercial films, the singing and dancing does come in a set piece and mm. it, it's just part of no storytelling. You just have to do it because you have to do it. Maybe in some films in the background. So. You, you really can't, a lot of people say this, and maybe I'm going to be speaking against them when I say this, but you can't really get into a character if you have to sing and dance every 20 minutes in a film. You know, it's not a musical, it's not being laid out like that, you're not playing, I don't know how you pronounce his name, Bob Fosse, you're not, uh, uh, you know, it's not all that jazz. It, somewhere down the line, it's just a song and dance. Right. I, I don't know, I'm sorry to say, how to dance in character. Uh, you know, how would a... X person dance in this, we, we always do our regular dancing. Mm -hmm. So uh, it becomes difficult mainly when I'm playing a more realistic role. Uh, like say, my name is Khan. Mm -hmm. But then again, those are the technicalities. It's not uh, something that you can't do. It's challenging maybe. You spend some time, uh, prep it as well as you can and hope it lands well, like you said. Uh, but no, it, it, I can never say it as an actor that, oh, this was so difficult. It mm -hmm. took the life out of me. No, I don't think there's been a role like that. All of them are nice. I find the ones which are regular roles, those more difficult to play. Right. You know, especially in the Indian commercial scenario that mm. you're just a regular guy mm. and playing it. You know, if they have crutches and stuff, then it's easier to play, I think. How long do you have to rehearse for a, a dance number, a set piece? Yeah. You know, I, I started off, there was a movie many years ago when I started, about in 94, 95, I released a film called uh, Bazigar. And that was the first time they had a dancing number for me, like a set piece with a lot of dancers. <laughs> and I went for rehearsals. I went for four days of rehearsals and days, day and night. I used to go two in the afternoon, finish mm. at 4 a.m. in the morning, and I thought I'm, I'll kill it. And uh, because the song that I'd done before, I was um, miserable at on the sets. I was pathetic. And then I came back after four days and nights and did the shot, and I was exactly at the same <laughs> level of misery, and I did it as badly. And so about 20 years, 15 years back, I decided never to rehearse. <laughs> really? Because I can't get better. <laughs> so I just, uh, you know, as soon as I come on the sets, I just request the choreographer. I start touching their feet and all. I say, you know, I just, I'm gonna just do it this much only. Take one shot. So they normally shoot with me. Hello. And that's you know, it. So I said, please don't. He's actually being very modest. That's good. Oh, no, good. No. That's you good. also invented the Shah Rukh Khan style, haven't you? I mean, there's. You know, there's a there's a style that is kind of famous now, where I put my arms out. Yeah. And I do nothing. <laughs> I, just, I just put my arms out. It's very smart. Nothing. Smart. nothing so, Whenever anything goes wrong in dancing, where there are those complicated steps where you have to do all that. So when, when they do that, what hip hop, big bop, what lock and pop. So when they do that stuff, I say, you know what, my character would just stand like this. And they go, yeah, yeah, I'm going to try please. that in life. Yeah, please, just stand there. That's I'll tell you a story. One day, one time in a film, I had to uh, be an organist, play an organ. An organ, you're playing with all four limbs, mm -hmm. hands and feet. I, could not, I couldn't even get the piano part. <laughs> um, fortunately, the, you know, they shoot the hands and they cut down and shoot someone else's feet. But I couldn't even get the piano part. I couldn't get both hands. So what we did was, I, I, had, the, I had the bass line with the left hand. Mm -hmm. And what we did was, we got another guy who could play an organ, whose hand looked close enough, 
and we cut a hole in the back of my jacket, and he slid his hand through, and I just did this. <laughs> and he, and he, uh, he made the thing work. It looks great. You want to tell us which movie so we can go back and look? Tree of Life. It. Tree of Life. Of yeah. <laughs> Brad, you said to Associated Press... Just to let you know, if Bacha, all those... Uh, now that we are opening up and letting out all yeah. the secrets, yeah. <laughs> so all those card tricks are done exactly the same way. I had this magician from Bangalore. He put his hand through my jacket. <laughs> <laughs> all of them. The magic of movies. Brad, you said to Associated Press recently that as you're getting older, you're gravitating more to the producing side than in front of the camera because shooting a film is a big commitment. Is that a hard balance to strike? And Shahrukh, can you relate to that? Well, I was saying, you know, it, anymore as I, as I get older that, uh, you know, it's a big commitment. You know, it's their long days. I don't know about you, but we're definite 12 hour days, if not sometimes 14, even 16, if it goes long. You have, yeah. yeah. And because you got to get the shot. And it's a big commitment. It's a big time away from, from family. And more and more, I find myself doing less and less and concentrating more on, or at least, uh, you know, on the, on the production side um, that's been growing. And, and, uh, and I, just, I just find it um, really rewarding to be able to, with my partners, be able to um, open up doorways for other filmmakers, filmmakers we really respect to make films and, 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 and tell their stories. Uh, I just, in putting those out in the world, I find that uh, um, a, a special, I find that a real um, um, gift to be able to do. Well, I, I think like if you start off from the uh, concept of wanting to tell stories, mm -hmm. and if you can last as long as, say, Brad has done, and if you have uh, partners, like say Jeremy and Didi, I have some uh, friends in my company and mm -hmm. partners. Uh, I, I think that's, that's a natural way to go, that you will want to keep telling stories and there only has so many stories you can tell as an actor. And as age goes, I mean, you can't honestly be doing the roles that you would love to now, mm -hmm. but you can't. It, it's nicer if you're able to give that uh, opportunity, chance, platform, and relive those things as a storyteller, uh, you know, by being a producer. You know, both of you have had incredible success as producers. Brad, your company, Plan B, was behind two recent Oscar-winning titles, Moonlight and 12 Years a Slave, among others. Shahrukh, you've delivered the blockbusters in Om Shanti, Om and Chennai Express, but you've also stuck your neck out and taken risks with films like Ahsoka and Paheli and Ravan. Um, how do you pick what you want to produce? Is there, um, is there, is there a formula to it? And is there a different approach? No, there's not a formula. I mean, uh, you know, one, you pick really good people to work with, mm. uh, uh, people who are smarter than you in, in many areas. And uh, in uh, my partners are sitting right over here, Dee Dee Gardner and Jeremy Kleiner. We started probably about 12 years ago, roughly, a little more. And, uh, and just one, I mean, we're figuring it out as we go along, but, you know, we, we were all lovers of film and, and, and wanted to, you know, just tell stories that were relevant to our time. And, and again, you know, promote filmmakers that, that uh, we really believed in and, and was a joy to work with and to, um, you know, help clear the way so they can bring their vision. And it, that, it's that mandate that has worked really well for us and has been really rewarding for us mm -hmm. at, uh, as an experience. And, and I think we'll, we'll stay on the, you know, that same kind of uh, trajectory. Um. Again, like you said, you get people around you who are smarter or at least have a different vision mm. of filmmaking than just you and you, know, and, and you get along with them and you kind of sit together and work out. Initially, when I started, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not from here. To become a producer was a big leap forward. But the bottom line was <coughs> you, there, there were a couple of films I was part of initially and nobody wanted to produce it. And I won't name some of them which got produced uh, because I was not just part of it but kind of helped them mm. uh, with other producers because there's some really wonderful films. Uh, but my choice was that whichever film nobody wants to produce, let's produce it. And I was sitting with my partners, Aziz and Jui once, mm -hmm. and we were making a film, and we were thinking of partnering with someone. We had gone and pitched it to a lot of people, mm -hmm. and everybody kind of said, not this, why don't you do the one, like the last one, you know, that was successful, and we went on. And there was a gentleman who used to always sit in those meetings who had nothing to do with films. He was a construction company owner, mm -hmm. had nothing to do with cinema. And he used to come and sit in the meetings, he's Aziz's friend. And he turned around and said, I like to produce it. And we said, but you make buildings. 
He said, but you guys are so good. I love what you do. And uh, I'd like to produce it. He said, you lose money. He said, it's all right to lose money on you. And I think it just came across to us, if there is someone uh, who can lose money on us, let's try losing ourselves. And you said, okay, <laughs> you know, let's just go and make the films nobody else wants to make. So it kind of started off like that. But lately, yes, uh, I think my production company takes care of try to make a rider film. We keep it very simple, try and earn some money, and then actually make the films that nobody else wants to make, but you want to tell the story. Brad, I think you will appreciate, and I'm hoping Shahrukh will back me up here, that the Indian film industry is really a, a different kind of beast in that it's, it's one of the few cinemas that has succeeded in resisting the massive influence and the onslaught, if you like, of Hollywood. Um, mm. American movies do very well in India, but uh, we have a very vibrant film industry, mm. and, um, and, and the predominant film industry is the Indian movie industry. Shahrukh, is there any fear of that changing? I, I've said it for the last 10 years. Uh, if we don't hone up in a few areas, and I'd say it again, uh, uh, especially in script writing, screenplay, marketing, and professionalism, and technology. If these five areas, we don't quickly adapt ourselves to the way not only the studios, but indie filmmakers, small producers make films uh, in Hollywood, we would get taken over by Hollywood. Uh, because there's no denying the fact they make some wonderful films. They have wonderful international stars. Uh, the language is becoming less and less of a barrier uh, with even more digital platforms. The access to them, the comparison uh, is now uh, right out there. I mean, you, you just have to have a telephone to be able to see any film that you wanted to see. It's not like going down to the embassy to see uh, the French film or an American film when you were young. Right. So I, I think if we do not uh, take on some of the wonderful things that Hollywood has done before, mm and learn from them, adapt them here, especially the professionalism part and technology, there is a big fear. Oh, that's interesting to hear because from, a, from afar, it, it's, uh, uh, I mean, we have great respect because you do have your, your own film language, mm. you have your own gestalt that is, that's, that's created, it's homegrown, and, uh, and enjoyed over there. So uh, it, it's really interesting, really interesting, interesting to hear about the, at least even the technology side. Um, it, it makes sense, it just would have never occurred to me. Yeah, because we have such wonderful stories here to tell, mm -hmm. but we're not telling them uh, in the way that uh, I think we get really happy just being a fad sometimes. That old Indian film, you know, singing, dancing, and everybody enjoys it all over the world. But if we are able to understand the language Hollywood and the Western cinema speaks in, and not change our own way of presenting a film, right. I mean, singing and dancing has to stay so that we keep Brad away from Bollywood, otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> but I think if we are able to uh, somehow get that writing part and technology in, uh, it, it's important, I think. It's extremely important, I think. Okay. It's, I find it really interesting, uh, uh, you know, different, um, different cultures now cross-pollinating ideas and, mm -hmm. and, and, and styles. And we just had a, a great experience producing a film, another Netflix film called Okja, with Bong Joon-ho, the South Korean director. And, uh, and it, it just became something we would never be able to create because it's from his mind. And, and, and uh, I, we, we're definitely seeking out more of those experiences. And, and I, I think we're going to see that more in the global community of filmmaking. That's going to be, um, it'll be interesting to see what, what comes out of it. We're going to, at this point, take a look at another clip from War Machine. And then I'm going to bring out another guest. Sean's the writer from Rolling Stone. He's been doing that profile piece on you. He's going to be tagging along for a couple days. Thanks for having me, sir. It's a real privilege. Rolling Stone. Yes, sir. Just make sure I'm on the cover. Well, it's uh, between you and Lady Gaga, sir. Well, put me in the heart-shaped bathtub with her. Rose petals. <laughs> Happy to share. Brad, stop joking. <laughs> Deadly serious, son. Put me on the cover. <clears throat> okay, we're very lucky to have with us today the director of War Machine, David Michaud. Come on, bud. All the best ones. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and writer. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I'm the surprise guest. You're the guest. surprise. You're the surprise, I'm the surprise guest. guest. Yes, you are. It's all downhill from here. Yeah. <laughs> 
Brad, David, why was Netflix the right partner for, for War Machine? Brad, you've said that without a delivery system like Netflix, this movie wouldn't have got made, or if it did get made, it would have been at one-sixth the budget only. So why was Netflix the right partner? Yeah, I may have exaggerated, maybe one-third. <laughs> but it wouldn't have been to the scope and scale. It's, be, you know, it's because the, the way the studio system is, the business model of the studio system now in Hollywood, um, it just can't support um, risky films like this, uh, films at this budget, certainly. Um, because of prints and advertising being so high and the cost, the, the ancillary cost being so high, they just, they're just not getting made right now. So for me, the beauty of Netflix or a delivery system like Netflix for the, for the film viewer is now more films are getting made. Uh, more interesting filmmakers are getting to the plate, telling their stories which means um, a greater variety of, of, of films for us to, to view. And so it, for me, it's this kind of renegade new um, resurgence in, in filmmaking that I, that I grew up on from the, you know, mainly the 70s, even the early 60s. And, I, and it's a really exciting time for us. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's exciting for me because, you know, I made my, my first film, Animal Kingdom, came out in 2010. Mm -hmm. I went to film school back in the mid-90s and it was right at that time, it was, it was after Quentin Tarantino's first couple of movies, there was a whole bunch of guys like him and Paul Thomas Anderson and David O. Russell and Wes Anderson and, and David Fincher and they were all making what looked like really bold, unusual, original movies inside the studio system. And then my first movie came out in 2010 and, uh, and it had all gone away. You know, the studios weren't making those kind, the kinds of movies that I thought I wanted to make. And I, I wasn't sure how I was ever going to get to make them. And then, suddenly, this Netflix, uh, this, this Netflix window opened for me that was uh, kind of extraordinary. I mean, War Machine is exactly that kind of movie that, you know, it's bold, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's complex, but it's, it's, it's wild. It's, I mean, it doesn't feel to me like how the movies feel. It's exactly the kind of movie that the, the traditional Hollywood studios aren't really making anymore. You know, it's a war film, so it was never going to be cheap to make. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just feel lucky that I'm, I'm that, you know, I didn't waste my time going to film school all those years ago. Shahrukh, in a market like India, yeah. um, how do you feel has Netflix impacted or will perhaps energize the existing landscape? Um, exactly. You know, this way that uh, we're always going to be tied down by this, uh, you know, cinema release films, mm. which have to be of a certain setup for them to get back the audience that you want and mm. the weekend collections, the weekly collections, the monthly collections. I, I think uh, Netflix will offer you an opportunity that this story needs to be told. It will be successful, successful also, inshallah. But some way it doesn't have the pegs that are expected of a film that should come in a theater and, uh, you know, take over the weekend. That's how art will grow and 100% and the business will follow. So I think Netflix in the next coming years, five years, giving opportunities to so many directors. And I, I think like in India, it, I, I find every, every household has a singer. Yeah. I think every household has a filmmaker. You know, we've been making films for so long, everybody wants to make a film. Sure. Uh, and I think uh, this is just the right time for all of them to come on board. Uh, you know, have opportunities uh, with, with companies like Netflix and say, okay, I don't need anybody else. I just mm. need this platform, have the freedom, and get a little bit of money to make a film. Everybody's not going to be wanting to make that big film, but, you know, just have the freedom. I think the most important uh, so it thing is... So democratize the filmmaking process then? Absolutely. Like you said, it's not a film by committee. It's not a set of people telling you what to do. Just come and make your film. And, and the best of films, I think, in the world were initially made like that. Mm. The sequels are made by the committees. Right. So I guess, you know... There's also something else about uh, releasing the film through Netflix. Um, you, you know, so much of, so many of our films are often um, categorized by opening weekend, by performance of opening weekend. Mm. And uh, it, it's, it's a, a really unfair jury of, of a film. Longevity is uh. the true test of a film. Is it still playing? Does it still speak to an audience 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road? And, and, and I've seen many good films be dubbed failures that, that and some have been found later in time and some, some haven't. Some go away. 
And I, I, I think this is taking, removing, I'm interesting to see removing that aspect, um, what that does to um, at least a film's reputation in the early days. Right. War Machine is based on Michael Hastings' book, The Operators, about General Stanley McChrystal's short and controversial stint during the US invasion of Afghanistan. Brad, you've said that you could identify with the character of the general because he got caught in the trap of hubris, just like a movie star, where you start to believe, and I'm quoting you, your own stink. Uh, <laughs> Shahrukh, you joked about being a self-absorbed movie star at the recent TED talk that you gave. Um, do you see self-absorption as a trap that movie stars often fall into? And how then do you keep it real? Well, first I'll say, you know, the hubris conversation, I was trying to correlate that to, to the film in the sense that any mistakes I've made is when, is when uh, I, you know, I think I have it figured out. And it seems that any mistakes we've made as a country is, is when we, we, we think we have all the answers. And it was that hubris that, that, that one has to question for oneself for any kind of personal evolution, but also uh, you know, what I think we need to constantly be, be, um, be looking at in ourselves as a country to, uh, to come up with another solution than, than what we've been doing. I, I, I mean, uh, I, I think yeah, a certain amount of uh, self-absorption is necessary uh, for any creative person, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, you're not, you're not a machine, war or otherwise, where you're going to just be following what people think should be done. You have mm -hmm. to have a free-thinking head. You have to have, uh, you know, poems of your own in your head. You've got to be telling stories that you want, whichever, paintings, whatever. So I think uh, a bit of self-absorption, it seems like it, uh, mainly because, you know, you'd like to say your idea or your thought or your belief or live by it. Mm -hmm. It can seem uh, self-absorbed, but having said that, I think any kind of self-absorption will lead to eventual, uh, uh, you know, you will be vanquished finally if you are just going to be self-absorbed in an uh, obsessive way. Mm. I think a little bit of it is required to be individualistic. Beyond that, no. I think uh, I, I, I would really honestly say, having worked with filmmakers um, all around the country, uh, writers, directors, wonderful actors, meeting them, I, I don't think they're just one or two like that. I don't <laughs> think <laughs> you have too many of them. But it's a good story to talk about that you're self-obsessed and you're self-absorbed, and that's how movie stars are, you're mad. But I don't it's think most cliche. people are, it's, it's a cliche. I think more often than not, people are wanting to share ideas. You know, you meet someone, and there's always be sharing of ideas and acceptance of somebody's ideas. Otherwise, a director, actor can't work together. Sure. You know, like you said in the very beginning, I'm in your hands. I like to be with people who I have faith in as friends, and, you know, and his ideas. He'd be, he's speaking his language. That really requires a lack of self-absorption. I, I believe an actor has to be the person who le loves himself the least, not the one who loves. For a stardom, yeah, for a stardom, yeah, you need to love yourself. So, Brad and me are both. We love ourselves the least and love ourselves the most because we are stars <laughs> and good actors, yeah, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Brad, Shahrukh, both of you have been at the forefront of major technological changes and advancements in the movie business. I suppose it's only fitting to ask all three of you um, as we wrap this up, what are the big foreseeable changes you predict over the next 10 years in the entertainment business? Whew, I don't pretend to know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, you know, I think it is a very, very interesting time and things are moving very, very fast. We're, being, we're getting more connected. We're, we're viewing our, certainly our, our or entertainment in much different ways. I, I don't know. I usually, uh, I live by calling the audible, as we say. We, you know, we, we, we make those calls, you know, at the moment. But I couldn't, I couldn't say. I, 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 uh, I couldn't say. You? I, mean, I would say in an Indian context more, yeah. because I think the industry is still kind of newer compared mm. to the West, yeah. So, yeah, technology is going to make a, a huge play. Uh, you know, if you see a wonderful film like Bahubali, and, those are the cinema, you know, the, the event films, so to say, our own superheroes. Right. I think we still haven't made them enough, so they will make a big foray into it. And uh, with the platforms like Netflix, and suddenly in the last 10 years, like I said, so many new directors and storytellers sprouting all over the country. You know, uh, you know we have a very big regional cinema also, south and east and west, mm -hmm. apart from Hindi-speaking uh, cinema. And, and it's really huge. 
and all those directors would get an opportunity to come and tell a story without having to be dependent on uh, you know just the few major players so to say in hindi cinema i think that's extremely exciting uh, you know i i i read things now and suddenly there's a new director making a small film mm. suddenly a set of boys and girls have gotten together and uh, you know i think the next thing is the way the kids are watching films they're watching them differently they have comparisons internationally now it's not just your own film so i think uh, that all is going to change the way stories told in india so i i think yeah next 5 7 years uh, positively speaking very exciting uh, it's nice to say that sure. but i think uh, it, i i think it's going to change the balance of power uh, as far as uh, filmmakers and film writers go david i mean in some ways i'd just be i'll be interested to see you know in which ways things kind of stay the same you know it's like there's a, obviously there's a lot of talk going on at the moment about you know should films be in theaters and mm. blah 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 and all mm. the stuff that's been going on at can and obviously what we're in is a kind of transitional period yeah. you know you can feel these kind of tectonic these kind of these tectonic plates kind of crashing into each other and stuff will change and one of the things you hear especially with streaming services and Oh, bar is that you know it's like the shape may change and there's limited series and directors can make 6 hour movies and all this uh, and i have you know i i i'm less concerned about where my movies play or what's kind of screen or blah, blah blah what i love more than anything else is the shape of the feature film you know it's the a movie that is about 2 hours long I just love the I love being able to tell a story in that length of time. I love the being able to devote a lot of time to the making of it, the crafting of it. Uh I I my great hope is just that whatever it, whatever shape the distribution and the exhibition takes that that just the shape of the the movie survives because I just I love them. I love them. I love the way he says two hours. We're still trying to get there. Yeah. Make a twelve film, <laughs> make three hour films. You got the hundred and twenty day shoot. It's like kill for one of those. <clears throat> Do you feel like the world will become a smaller place in that there will be an exchange and um, you know a crossover? Will will we see Brad in a Hindi movie, Shahrukh you in a Chinese film? Do you feel like that is the future as well? Not till I learn to dance and sing. I mean, hi, hi, yeah, cha, yeah. <laughs> as long as i know i i think yes most certainly i think uh, in the last 10 years itself you know you have a lot of indian actors going uh, and being except even if it's part of diversity yeah um, <laughs> uh, angle that america has but i think it's opening doors he's from australia he's gone made films mm. there uh, i'm sure if he likes india he's visited here he went for a long walk today if he likes that walk um, that was a good walk it was a good walk he may come and make a film here it'll start off like that brad shot a film here you know some of the uh, filmmakers will come to shoot film in india but i think they will understand they'll see like we watch all their films and understand the kind of language they use yes i th i think uh, i mean true the i hate using this word but this globalization yeah and, uh, yeah would happen uh, most certainly thank you gentlemen thank you brad thank you david have a great time while you're here in, in india brad you have your work cut out for you on the next trip perhaps Sharu will show you a few dance moves okay. <laughs> piano piano I'm going to learn the piano from him right I'm going to learn the one and piano but really thank you for being here and wish you all the best with this film no Generally. thanks for and, having and, us uh, and thank you Rajiv for talking to us and talking about this film thank you Sharu thank you Brad thank you David thank, thank you. you very much thank Great. you